and it will be part of an HFD um, collection coming out early next year. And the scope of the study was basically uh, looking at some uh, ongoing project in this field and also uh, discussing shared chances and challenges. And I did this together with four other people listed here, my co-authors. Um, and uh, after thanking the HFD for hosting us, I also want to thank, of course, the German Ministry of Education for funding all our work. Digital credentials in higher education. Um, it's usually two steps when it comes to digitalization or digitization, whatever you, you call it. And that's also the case here. Uh, first, you move from paper to files, which is already a big step, which we'll see, and files and databases, so you can search for things a bit faster. But it's still a relatively modest amount of um, work that is being saved. And more importantly, the second step is standardization and machine-readable data, because that saves you a lot more time and in our use case of digital credentials that concerns especially the verification of credentials. And we'll come back to this in the panel indicated by this P here. I also have to do this once. So this is a diploma mill churning out fake diplomas. And that's a good reason to verify the credentials students present uh, to employers, for example. Um, there's also two central document types involved. Um, and we only talk about type two today. So this is basically, I've completed something. This is my master's, this is my bachelor's. We're not talking about international exchange where you have to have transcripts of records, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, there's also a lot of important projects going on there like MREX or PIM in Germany, but we can't touch this today. And um, also we'll talk about the technical side of things connected to what I've just said. And we won't talk about content so in terms of what did you actually do, because this is a totally different issue and also requires standardization, but not our thing today. Um, moving on, this is a prototypical workflow um, or like a model of a blockchain uh, for education. So you can see here it's German, uh, but it doesn't matter, I think. There's different international cities, people studying there, people maybe also um, going to some MOOC websites and getting credentials there in the future, also a possibility. And um, all these websites and international and universities uh, could then issue to this red circle, which would be the blockchain, uh, could issue credential files and at the same time store a fingerprint in this red blockchain. And later on, anyone, for example, employers, but also other universities where you may be transferred to, uh, could then check if that fingerprint matches the fingerprint of the document that you show them. So that's the, um, the basic idea of having the blockchain as a verification helper, so to say. And there are some cryptographic basics, and I won't go into detail uh, about this today. Uh, but it's important for the blockchain and for some surrounding issues that we may touch in the discussion. So first there's hashing, which is basically basically a one-way street. So you have any kind of uh, data, a long string of text, and you can map it to a fingerprint that always has a fixed size, for example, 64 characters. And it also changes a lot. Once you make a minor change in the input, the fingerprint changes a lot. So it's a very secure thing. It's not easy to get what the input was. It's basically almost impossible. And uh, so hashing is used for getting fingerprints for documents, like for example, um, digital credentials. And signing is a two-way street. You know, may know this from safe email communication where you can sign a message with your private key. And that can only be, and other people can verify that it was actually you sending the message because only your public key, which everyone knows, uh, fits the signature, so to say. Uh, the slide describes it a bit more, but uh, I think we don't really have time for that and it's not necessary. So hashing and signing, important background for blockchain implementations. A blockchain in general is a chain of data blocks, as it says, that linearly grows. So it can only grow, blocks can be added, nothing else can happen in terms of changes normally and should happen. So that's why you often hear this word immutable. And um, the reason or for this, how it is implemented that you would have to take a massive effort to change the chain is that all blocks are linked to the previous blocks. So a block always contains a header and a body and um, the header contains the link to the previous block in terms of a hash of the previous block. Uh, so you'd have to change all blocks. If you want to change one block, you have to change all the following blocks that already exist in the chain. So that makes it a very stable and fixed structure. 
Um, and the, the blocks contain the individual transactions and each transaction in our case could be used to issue or to uh, basically store a fingerprint of a DC in the chain. Um, in terms of how you set up, and our speakers will this, uh, panelists will know much more about uh, this than I, um, if you run this internationally as a network, you always have to decide who is a node, who can write, who can read. And for the DC use case, it usually makes sense that only the institutions can actually write. So the issuing institutions can write to the chain uh, and they know each other and have agreed somehow who's part of the network and who isn't. Uh, but everyone else can, for example, read. So there's uh, independent websites could be created where you could verify your credentials because they could read the chain, not only uh, those that take part in the network. So that's that's a general idea. And um, also all nodes uh, in a blockchain network hold a copy of the entire chain. That's another uh, uh, important aspect of blockchains. And this decentral storage means there's no central authority that can that has the data just by itself and can make changes. And data loss is also highly unlikely because you have all these copies. What's important is that new transactions and new blocks get added to the chain. So there has to be a kind of mechanism you agree what the chain looks like at a certain point in time. So the consensus between the network nodes has to be reached. And in this case, this is much easier than with currency chains like Bitcoin uh, or other things, because there's definitely a shared interest. It's not that someone wants to have more money than others, but usually you have this shared interest that everyone wants to have these easily verifiable and trustable credentials. So it's much easier and we'll touch this in the discussion again. And I think all this, uh, to come back to the title of our session, can also promote cooperation and standardization a lot. The field is currently highly dynamic. The first was uh, BlockSerts, uh, which is an open source project, still going strong by the MIT and uh, Learning Machine at the time. And the uh, state of Malta, for example, has already issued BlockSerts, I think, 2017, and the MIT as well. And that's so basically the prototype. But since then, many more initiatives, publicly funded and commercial projects have joined the game. Uh, this is a, there's a long list, Germany, EU, also in the States right now, a lot of state uh, gives a lot of money to people developing stuff with this education blockchain initiative. Um, and a lot of startups in Germany, the first ones that are, are mentioned, uh, but then also internationally that you can see here. And we may come back to this as well. So it's a highly dynamic field. And to quickly say something about the concrete projects before we open the panel. Uh, so we have Andreas Wittke from DigiCerts, which is networks of nine partners from Germany and Austria. And the basic workflow is very much what I described when I showed you this picture with the red circle. Um, I uh, won't go into much detail here. So you, you receive a PDF and this is backed up by the blockchain for verification. And so more or less what I told you early on. Um, and there's always this matching. Does the fingerprint match? Then yes, the um, credential hasn't been tampered with. There's further, my computer allows me, there's lag. I can't switch to the next uh, slide right now, unfortunately. Let's, let me wait. What happens here? Yes, almost there. So EduCTX, uh, this is Mohammed's project. It's a network of three partners from Slovenia, Czech Republic, and Germany in Bielefeld. And uh, they have a somewhat more complex uh, implementation, also using an Ethereum derivative, uh, so a different blockchain like uh, DigiCert does. Um, and students get their own blockchain accounts here. So it's a bit different in detail, but the overall processes are, of course, similar. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll save the details in the interest of time. Um, I Hopefully we can make these slides available afterwards as well, um, because I don't want to, that people don't get, like, I mean, you can always visit websites as well, but yeah, you see this here. Let me come to our third, um, project, which is a digital credentials consortium consisting of 12 international partners, all high profile and highly international universities. And uh, they're, um, they're, they're running this network that tries to establish standards for like international standards actually is interested in this, has, has written a long white paper on this. 
and uh, is also currently implementing prototypical infrastructure. They take uh, actively part in the W3C Verifiable Credential Standard Group, which is an interesting group that everyone can actually join and has also impact uh, on Europass, et cetera, uh, developments. And they specifically focus on the long-term strategy, so business models, who will run the ne those networks in the long run, incentives for universities, et cetera. And um, yeah. yeah, fraud here, credential fraud that I mentioned is a specifically high problem here, I think, if you have a very international and high-profile institutions. And um, I think Hans can, can tell us about that. After 11 minutes, I would like to open the panel uh, with our three panelists today. That is uh, Professor Dr. Mohamed Tukanovic, who is a PI in, uh, in the blockchain lab at the University of Maribor in Slovenia for EduCTX. It's uh, Dr. Hans Pongratz, who's the Senior Vice President and CIO at the Technical University of Munich for the DCC. And Andreas Wittke, last but not least, for DigiCert. He, uh, uh, he works at the uh, University of Applied Sciences in Lübeck and also uh, has pretty much founded on campus, as I understand it, the, the MOOC platform, and is a CDO at this university. Uh, Thomas, can you tell me anything about the poll results? There they are. Okay, so that's actually better or more than we have expected. Um, so we have a kind of te technical audience already, I would say, in part, compared to the average citizen. Um, that's highly interesting and yeah, hopefully will give us some guideline for the panel discussion, which I think we can start now. Um, so to make this uh, not too chaotic, I have three uh, initial questions for our three initial guests and afterwards is always for everyone basically. Um, so opening up, I'd first like to make the general meaning of transitioning from paper uh, to digital a bit more tangible, a bit more concrete. And there was an interesting story that Andreas uh, told me once from his institution in Lübeck, and I think he he could share that with us. That would be very nice, Andreas. Yes. <clears throat> Hello. Yes, uh, the story from from Lübeck was nice. So I asked my department where they store the certificates um, mm -hmm. in which room or on which tapes and uh, what is the process about it and they told me they, they print it out and they are going to the cellar and took it in a box in a, in a room and they right. and there has there has to be there for 40 years and th that's the law they told me I, I don't check that up and uh, so then I'm I'm thinking about uh, what happened if a meteor is coming and destroy our university or water or water or fire or something like that and uh, when the backup is destroyed and the cellar is destroyed nobody knows that our students are engineers or bachelors or masters and that was a little bit confusing me and because I, in my mind, we have a backup in the in a central uh, room or safety place in Kiel or right. in another town, but we didn't have that. Okay, so that's the shocking reality right now in terms of the paper world, and we should definitely work on this. I mean, we'll have to keep some paper copies for, I guess, a reasonable, uh, I mean, that's not in sight that we can get rid of it entirely, but um, I think it's a good motivation to work on this topic here, going digital with credentials. And moving on to the key issue maybe uh, here that I mentioned, so the incentive for inter institutions is basically credential fraud or like making the credential checking and verification faster and more reliable. And um, I think to illustrate this a bit more, I think all of you, starting with Hans, uh, I saw have some interesting numbers or, or stories about this as well. Like what motivates you working on these projects? Hans, please. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. I think it's it's coming for everyone. If you think we have a university with 43,000 students and we have about 35,000 applicants per semester, then you've got lots of paperwork to do and you have lots of numbers to cross-check because if you have just a manual feed of the student who gives the data within a formula and you have a paper copy and you have to cross-check, that makes lots of 
useless, I would say, no, it's not useless, we need it right now, but of time, but if we can stay, it, we can do it, compete in a different way. And so we have to look for digital credentials from my point of view. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, anyone else uh, wants to add something or some concrete story? I think otherwise we can probably move on. I think it's it's pretty clear. I mean, in the US alone, I read that more than 400 fake PhD certificates are issued every year by diploma mills. So even in the US, so it's not only it's not always just somewhere else in the world. Um, it's it's it happens everywhere. I would say, and in any uh, in any country. Um, so to complete the picture of in terms of incentive a bit, uh, let's move on to students and learners and also later workforce. Uh, Mohammed, do you have any, uh, like what would you say, what the main benefit is for them when it comes to digital credentials, uh, be it using blockchain or not? Well, besides uh, the obvious thing that we live in the 21st century and everything is e-formalized like the e-government uh, we at the university level should be the bare fronters of the technology technology use and besides that there are other um let's say benefits like for example the students could actually hold his or her digital credentials they wouldn't be able to be lost or if they are lost they can be then reissued uh, you can share them easily and not in a physical way like copying it uh, photocopying it sending it over regular mail so uh, also the companies can process data easier if it's in in, in a electronic form they process it harder if it's in a physical form they check it harder if it's a physical form if you have a digital credential which is digitally signed by qes or any other form uh, then it's really easy for companies to maybe scan various applications, scan diplomas, uh, etc. So there are many uh, useful uh, things when we think about digital credentials. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for also mentioning the electronic portfolio thing. That's something I forgot on, on the other slide with the red blockchain. It's actually very important that you can collect uh, in a lifelong manner all your credentials that you earned and basically selectively share this with websites like maybe LinkedIn where you want to display them, also display them as being verified already, but also with employers when, you, um, yeah, when you're aiming for a new position, basically. So they're actually getting something out of it as well, not just universities. Um, I think um, staying with students a bit, uh, totally different and very specific point um, to get a misconception out of the way about uh, blockchain use here. Um, imagine there's a student, she regularly attends Fridays for Future and says, now I heard that all my credentials in the future are going to be anchored to the same technology that has, uh, as I heard, the same environmental footprint like nation states, like Iceland or New Zealand maybe. And that gives me a very bad feeling about taking part in this system. What would you say maybe uh, staying with Mohammed for this uh, one what would you answer well these questions didn't came up only by our students they really came up by our representatives representatives of the states by the ministries and it was really funny that we had to uh, spend two or three months explaining to the ministries that there is no foot digital uh, like you said footprint uh, in carbon dioxide for this example to the ministries which should already know this uh, no, there is no connection to Bitcoins. We are not using the same platform, for example. Mm -hmm. If we would use these public networks, which are not necessary, there are possible side effects, but many of these platforms, they are based on consortium networks, which are decentralized, uh, let's say, based on various other universities, which form, let's say, a private slash consortium network, which does not have to yeah. use any resources in this case. So so, so if I understand you correctly, the key here is really that trust exists uh, in, in, uh, between the actors and everyone has a shared interest. In, so there is no need for mining like in Bitcoin because the whole mining thing without going to detail is basically just to prevent people from rigging the Bitcoin chain, you know, following their own interests. Someone wants all the Bitcoins uh, for themselves or whatever. So basically changing uh, the data in a fraudulent way. And this is kind of not an issue here because the universities, for example, running such a network agree on certain rules and agree on how uh, who writes uh, blocks, etc. So the the whole environmental impact is much, much. It's absolutely not comparable to the um, to, for example, Bitcoin and other money uh, chains. Uh, so that we have this out of the way, another practical one here. 
uh, blockchain and personal data. So we know there's the European uh, GDPR, and it basically says that uh, one personal identifier shouldn't be stored in uh, databases, in this case, in like publicly readable special ones uh, in the blockchain. So student IDs or names shouldn't be uh, stored, not even in a pseudonymized form. And at the same time, there's also this right to be forgotten so that your data is going to be deleted from public databases or from blockchains. And this directly collides with the immutability that I um, laid out in the introduction. So what is your take on this and how does your project address this? I, I, uh, I want to give the, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to ask Andreas first because I think they have some certification there. Is that correct? Yes, um, we have a legal opinion about this. Uh, we asked a special lawyer uh, about our technology and mm -hmm. uh, we get um, yes, a legal opinion about that everything is correct. So the, the data protection is okay and everything is fine with the system because we are not writing sensitive data in the blockchain we are only writing hash tables or hash data mm -hmm. in it and uh, because we are using the quorum or uh, the ethereum blockchain so mm -hmm. we can uh, then write a flag in, in the blockchain about with smart contracts when a uh, master degree is wrong or something is wrong so we said this we write a flag mm -hmm. in it that the data is not actually actual. okay that that's not a valid credential anymore basically yes yeah. exactly that's, that's always an important future to credentials to be revoked and i think all projects uh, have had that in mind as well um so we can so basically i think also with uh, discussions i had with several of you um we can agree it's a bit of a gray area right now um as i understand it in in your uh, case andreas it's because the hash you write to the chain only a very minor a bit of it is actually the the student id and then there's lots and lots of other data and then you take a hash of all, all this together and so it's not um it's like basically no one could ever reverse this hash i mean it's not to be reversed in the first place but there are methods to to at least try this but so basically the way you do it makes it even harder to kind of find out any personal information that's uh, uh i mean i wanted to raise a topic we won't have time to go into any more detail i'm afraid it is a very interesting topic um but let's say it's a bit unclear right now how this will move on and um, maybe changes of law and uh, also changes in technology will be required to actually address this uh, issue efficiently um there's another important thing i'd like to bring up and that's interoperability because as you saw in the intro there's lots of companies lots of uh, state-funded projects and they're all like having their chains now and everyone is starting to issue uh, digital credentials so what if in five years from now there's basically just one winner or there's like maybe three most important international things maybe they're going to go back to issuing it on global uh, chains like the bitcoin one maybe they're going to be it's going to be small consortia whatever happens how do we make sure that a, a verification website doesn't have to speak to 100 different chains or will it know from the credentials checking and um, or like that people don't have to go to 100 websites employers to check uh, credentials backed up by different blockchains uh, does anyone have a good idea on this please raise your hand okay mohammed i think the uh, users won't have to worry about this because like the microwave you just put the food in it and it comes out so the same principle is here we technicians we will solve this problem also there are already a lot of uh, cross-platform uh, solutions so for so there are solutions for this and they will be made none even if some platforms maybe die off so uh, there there are technical solutions to solve these problems which the normal users shouldn't be really uh, worried about yeah Okay, so basically the credential, for example, could say uh, I'm backed up by this and this chain and then the verification website just talks to this specific chain without the user noticing. That was what I was hoping for and people would be hoping for, I guess, that they don't have to do anything. Um, Thomas just showed me there's an maybe important question from the audience. I think it's to do with ECTS, right, Thomas? That's, uh, is that, did I get that? Yeah, so 
could ECTS uh, the credit points uh, somehow be linked to the chain? I think that's actually a question you tried to address in your first implementation, Mohammed. There's this 2018 paper where you wanted to do something with credit points and eventually I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think basically political reasons or like this this whole Bologna system being not open enough at this point for this uh, for this whole micro credential thing, etc., kind of changed plans uh, for for uh, like it's not something you can do right now. Yeah, to be short, we tried in the first implementation to uh, generate so much tokens which are equal to so much ECTS point for a regular course. However, there, uh, if you want as a student to say, I passed this course, you need to have more information than represent just ECTS points. The possible employer would need to know which course did you pass, where did, where, where did you pass it, in which university, who presented this course, and these things can be um, changed. They have to be anchored in some ways. And in this case, you always get into the politics of one national yeah. state. And if you're in the EU, in the Bologna system, then you have a lot of other uh, university systems, which then you have these organizational okay. problems. OK, OK. So we, we get that it's very difficult. And at this time, not, not basically within the realm of what we are talking about here, about just diplomas and making them easier to verify and faster. So um, maybe. Um, since we're approaching the end already, I'd like to ask, um, and I, because I know that the DCC, for example, specifically addresses this this long-term uh, question, um, Hans, in terms of business model and the long-term outlook, who's going to run these networks? Uh, do universities actually have an interest? Is this like a window right now? And once everyone does it, it's not a unique selling point anymore. There's you know, to get more students or whatever. What What's the actual interest? What's in there for the institutions? And how is this going to play out in the long run? Hans? Thanks. I would say there were different aspects already mentioned. On the one hand, we have to be fair. If you look at the paper-based certificates right now, um, we don't have the semantics around how much point they are and, and so on. You always need an interpretation of it. And I think we have the same issue with all the digital solutions. And from my point of view, it makes sense that we have this additional uh, credentials consortium focus on specific standards. So there could be different implementations, but they can all interact with each other. And that was one topic of this panel, I would say. How can we have a collaboration between universities, between higher education institutions? And from my point of view, understanding, we should define the standards. And then we have our colleagues work with them. And there could be companies, there could be an ecosystem and stuff like that. And from my point of view, I don't want to run a system like this on my own as a university. There are others around who are much better in support and maintaining stuff like that. But I want to say what I, what I need. And there we are okay. right. And would you even go as far as saying maybe we don't have to develop it at all as, as a university consortium, but we could just basically like the typical uh, build or buy decision. I mean, we, there, there's all these companies doing it now, like Digitary with whole nation states mm -hmm. like Australia. They have these like, would you also consider just buying a solution? Yes, right now we're building up prototypes to look what we really need, because right now you're normally in the rapid prototyping phase that you really want to show our users, our students, our staff what it looks like. And then we can define, OK, if there are companies who build it like this or not. And I think there are good approaches already around. And it's great what the colleagues here are doing. And I think if we exchange on this basis, we really get something that helps us and our students. And from my point of view, that's not one solution. We are, have more than 190 countries around the world. We have 7 billion persons around. And we don't even get Germany to right now adjust our paper-based certificates. Why should we then think that we can a digital solution for the world? I think we have to define standards, and then we'll see. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for that. And I mean, a good example that we can't discuss, like millions of other questions now, is the OZG, so the German cousin of the single digital gateway uh, legislation from the EU. And this is a good example where it's hard enough uh, in one state to actually agree on standards and establish uh, uh, those to move forward digitally. So since we're basically out of time, I'd like to thank all our panelists again today. It was a very much too short uh, run, and I hope that uh, audience um, attendees can maybe approach the, uh, our panelists afterwards with more specific questions, can also approach the IRT, maybe read our upcoming paper, 
And um, I hope that everyone got out of this, that is, this is a highly dynamic thing with lots of players in the field and that, there, that there's lots of chances, but also challenges left to be addressed. And hopefully in some kind of future panel that is a bit longer, we can, we can come back and ask some more questions. I thank you all uh, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.